I'll just hit the record to the cloud button. Mm -hmm. and now it'll record. Okay, yep. now it's going. Yes. Okay, cool. great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and, and thanks, Christina, especially for the, 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 the warm introduction and the, the, the welcome. And today I'm going to talk about the health consequences of playing football using observational data. And in the interest of it being uh, a Friday afternoon, I'm going to try to keep the technicalities to a minimum and really focus on building intuition about why estimating treatment effects with observational data is a like statistically challenging problem. I'll outline the particular approach that we used when studying it in the context of playing football, and we'll leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. So throughout this talk, like please don't hesitate to, to unmute yourself and, and interrupt me and ask a question. Um, so please, please don't feel uh, like this is super formal. So let me see if I can get this slide to advance. There we go. So before I start, I really want to acknowledge a bunch of my awesome collaborators without whom any of this, like, like none of this is possible without them. Um, I especially want to mention Professor Dylan Small at Penn, uh, who, who kind of spearheaded these efforts and got, the, got these projects off the ground. And also two of my fellow students, Ryden Hasegawa and Jordan Weiss. Um, and, and they really helped with a lot of the design of these studies and sorting through the statistical issues but this was also really, I think, a, a really wonderful collaboration with a bunch of clinicians, and in particular, Drs. Amanda Rabinovitz, Christina Master, Timothy Galton, and Mark Newman. And there were many other people who helped with this work, and, and I want to give them all credit for that. So over the last decade or so, we've seen an increased concern over the safety of playing football. And, and I think this concern is driven from at least two, like two, there are two main drivers for this. The first was there was a series of, of newspaper reports about sort of high profile suicides of former professional players and former collegiate players. And then more subsequent reporting came out about, you know, former college players and former professional players really suffering from pretty adverse health uh, events. What also happened in the last decade was in the scientific literature, there were a lot of reported cases of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And this is a progressive degenerative brain disease whose early symptoms include things like headaches and, and dizziness and a little bit of confusion but it can rapidly progress into, into much worse outcomes like memory loss and aggression and suicidality. And CT is thought to result from repetitive head trauma, the sort of which you would have encountered if you played a lot of football. And there was a major study uh, a few years ago done by some folks at Boston University where they looked at 111 brains that were donated by uh, former NFL players and they found CTE in 110 of them. So this seems like something that's like 99 something percent prevalent in in, in former professional players. And this really, I think, shocked a lot of people and it really stimulated a, a, a vibrant discussion about the safety of playing football. And it's not just people talking about it. I think there's been some, some real changes in terms of the game and policy. So at least at the professional level, the NFL has instituted a new concussion protocol where players are held out if they are thought to suffer from brain injuries. And, and at least in the collegiate level, there are some leagues or some conferences which have banned tackling in practice in the interests of promoting player safety. So all of this brings us to an important question, which is to always think of the children. And I will submit to you that, you know, you know this question of whether football is a safe sport for children to play has really big public health ramifications. And the reason for that is that over a million kids play high school football annually. And to put that number in perspective, a million kids playing high school football every year is at least one, if not two to three orders of magnitude greater than the total number of people who have ever played professional football. So we're dealing with this like potentially massive affected population. And with all of this you know, concern raised in the media and the scientific literature, there have been a lot of parents and doctors and lawmakers who have called for placing age restrictions on youth tackle football. There are some states that are considering outright bans. So I know Massachusetts last year was considering banning uh, youth tackle football under, I think, before grade seven. And this, you know, unsurprisingly has, has prompted a pretty big debate. Um, and so on one side, you'll have people who say that high school football is totally safe. And they might say that on average, high school players typically have less head trauma than professionals, a consequence of them playing less football overall. And so maybe because they are less affected and may not have as much exposure to head injuries, maybe they're not as, as high of a risk of suffering these sort of like really serious uh, cognitive and mental decline. 
On the other hand, you're going to have some parents and doctors who say that football is so inherently dangerous that even a little bit of participation can lead to catastrophic uh, you know, negative health consequences. And there are some small scale neuroimaging studies that have identified acute white matter changes um, after a single season of play. What hasn't been established yet from those studies though is whether these changes sort of persist over time and whether they lead to long-term complications. So I think if we were to look at the state of the science, I think it's pretty undecided whether playing football is, is safe for kids, if it's safe for kids to continue to play football. And, I'll, and I will suggest that the real question we're after is estimating the long-term causal effects. You know, what will happen to kids if they play football many, many years down the line? And I will say that answering this question is, is like super important in terms of formulating policy. I mean, in general, like good science is a necessary precedent for good and impactful policy. So that's really what's motivating us in this talk. What are the long-term causal effects of adolescent high school football participation on long-term health? So here's a really short outline of the talk. Um, most of this will be about talking about methods and how we, how we address this, this question. And then I'll share some results and, and some parting thoughts. So just so that we're all on the same pages, are there any questions to this point? Cool, so let's, let's crack on. So we wanna estimate the causal effect of playing football. So at some point in your statistics education, you probably heard that randomized control trials are the gold standard for estimating causal effects. And the reason for that is that randomization creates a treated group and a control group that are balanced by design. And that probably doesn't really mean much to you at this point. So let's, let's put it in the context of the football study. So imagine I got a pool of say a thousand kids and I flipped a coin and you know, said if, if for each kid I'll flip a coin and if it comes up heads, I'll say they're gonna be forced to play football for several years. And if it comes up tails, I, it, they won't be. And so the process of randomizing treatment within this group is going to ensure that the treated group and the control group are not systematically different along variables that might be important. So if I truly randomize treatment and randomize football participation, then it won't be the case that the football players are somehow bigger, faster, stronger, and healthier than the controls. And the reason that this is important for estimating possible effects is that if you have groups that are balanced by design, then when you observe any difference in outcomes, you can attribute that to treatment. So if it turns out to be the case that, you know, I, I ran this RCT, which, you know, it seems simple enough. You get a bunch of kids, you flip some coins, you randomly allocate football participation, and then you wait for, I don't know, 10, 15 years and see how they're doing. So this seems like a pretty straightforward way to, to, to estimate the causal effect. I think there are at least two problems. And the first is it's, and practically, like, like there's gonna be a long follow-up that's required. So if we wanna know what's gonna to happen to kids who are currently playing football, what's gonna to happen to them when they're 40, 50, 60 years old, we have to wait until they're 40, 50, and 60 years old. So this is a really long time horizon. But that's not you know, the worst thing in the world. I think the more serious issue is that this type of randomized control trial is like totally unethical. You, you will never get this past the review board because you can't force somebody to continue to play, especially if you think it's dangerous. Um, so, so this seems like we're stuck. You know, the, the gold standard for estimating causal effects, uh, we, we simply can't appeal to that. So we're gonna be stuck using an observational study. And the fundamental challenge with observational studies is that treatment assignment is no longer random. And this means that the football playing group and the non-football playing group are not directly comparable. So when we, look at our random, when we look at our observational study data, we might find that football players and non-football players differ in health and personality and maybe like their aspirations. And so if we just did a direct comparison of outcomes, we can't immediately attribute any difference in outcomes to the difference in football playing status. It could be attributable to any number of potential confounders which are not balanced between the two groups. So it, it would seem like we're kind of up the proverbial creek but luckily there are statistical solutions. And in this talk, we're gonna talk about one particular type of statistical solution, which is matching and randomization inference. So I, I will mention at this point that there are actually many ways that we could get at a causal effect uh, statistically, but we're gonna focus on one mode of causal inference. And maybe if there's time at the end, we'll talk about some other modes. So I think the next couple of slides, we're, we're gonna really try to unpack what I mean by matching and randomization inference. So matching. 
The challenge, again, is that in an observational study, football players and control subjects are not a priori comparable. The football players will generally be bigger, they'll be faster, they might, you know, they might be healthier, they might not drink as much, they might not smoke as much. Again, these are high school students, so I don't know, maybe that's too touchy. Um, but the basic idea is that we want, in order to make any causal effect, like estimate any causal effects, we are going to have to compare the football players to the controls. But the idea with matching is that what if we could focus on a subset of our entire study population, which actually were balanced along a lot of covariates that we could measure. So the idea is to introduce a partition of our study subjects such that in each partition, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of create these matched sets. And you can think of these as matched pairs. So for every football player, we're going to try to find a control subject who is as similar to that football player as possible in terms of maybe their family background and their adolescent health and maybe any number of variables that we've thought to adjust for. So the idea is that you know, we're going to kind of whittle down our pool of subjects into ones that are actually comparable. And the reason for doing that, I think, is best summarized by this quote from Byron Brown, who was, was a really famous statistician. And he wrote that when you talk to clinicians and other non-statisticians, no amount of post-stratification or covariance analysis, especially if they're complex, are going to be as convincing as a demonstration that the two groups you were comparing were balanced in the beginning. And he goes on to say that this demonstration might be difficult, but it's often sufficient to satisfy the suspicious and quell the unbelievers. So that's maybe far more poetic than anything that I could have come up with. But the basic idea is that if you want to estimate a causal effect, what he's saying is that no matter how fancy the statistical methods you use, to a non-statistical audience, that won't be as convincing as if you had just demonstrated that the groups you were comparing were actually comparable to start with. And so this is kind of the ideal goal that we're going to work with. We, we've got this large pool of study subjects. We've got a lot of football players, a lot of controls. They're not a priori comparable. So how can we find the ones who are? And, that, and that's really the game we're going to be playing. So are there any questions about that? Okay, cool. So this is one second. There we go. So the next couple of slides are going to be fairly technical, but I want you to keep in mind that the, the, the main thing we're trying to do is find for each football player, find a control who's similar. And so what we're going to start with is we're going to let XI be a vector of observed covariates. So these are going to be things like family background and health history, maybe academic performance, adolescent health, substance abuse patterns, behavior, these are all the sorts of variables that you might expect influence a person's decision to play football or might be predictive of their decision to play football and might also affect their later life health. So to give you a concrete one, um, you know, there's many studies that suggest that socioeconomic status in childhood has a role to play in cognitive outcomes later in life. And we might say that, you know, maybe the football players tended to come from wealthier backgrounds so if we don't account in our sort of main analysis for childhood socioeconomic status, then any observed difference in cognitive outcomes could be attributed to differences in the socioeconomic status and not in the fact that some people play football and not. So similarly with, uh, you know, if, we, if we're focusing on whether people abused opiates later in life, then maybe if they had a, a history of a, uh, like drug abuse early in life, then maybe that could be a confounding factor. So in the studies that I'll describe in more detail later, we have typically about 50 to 100 of these observed covariates. And these all were measured during adolescence. So right around the time that these people were starting to play football. So for every person in our sub study, we're going to have a vector x of covariates. The next thing we're going to need is a distance metric that's going to measure the distance between individual subjects covariates. So you can think of this distance metric row. It could be the Euclidean distance. It could be a Mahalanobis distance. It could be a rank-based Mahalanobis distance. It could basically be whatever distance you want, so long as it's a sensible distance. And for what we were doing, we, we tended to use the Mahalanobis distance because it can account for potential correlations between the, the covariates. So if we adjusted, for instance, for like the maternal education and paternal education, there might be some correlations there, and the, this distance metric will, will pick that up. And so once we're armed with a set of covariates for every every person and a distance metric, we can start to compute pairwise distances between all of the people on our subject. So we can look at every treated subject 
We can look at every control subject and we can compute a distance between them. And I'll say that a matched M is any set of pairs of treated and control subjects. So we'll talk about matched pairs right now, but everything I say will, will apply to say one to two matching or, or, or full matching where you can have one treated and multiple controls or multiple treated and one control. And so the idea is that you know, we, can, we can take all of our treated subjects, we can compute their distance in this covariate space to all of the controls, and we can assemble that into a big matrix. What we can then do is, is, is add a caliper. And, and the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna start by estimating a propensity score. So the propensity score is the probability that each subject is treated given their covariance. So even though in an observational study, the treatment assignment may not be random, our analysis is gonna mimic a randomized control trial. We're gonna sort of temporarily pretend that our data came from a random experiment so that it makes sense to talk about the probability that somebody received treatment given their, given their covariates. And then we'll sort of assess We'll, we'll sort of do some inference and then assess the sensitivity to this assumption a little bit later on. But the starting point now is gonna be from an estimated propensity score. And, and you know, the treatment assignment in this case is, is binary. They either played football or they didn't. So this really amounts to fitting like a logistic regression model, but you could fit something a little bit more complicated if you wanted. So we have a set of covariates. We've got a distance metric. We've got a propensity score. And we'll now form what I'll call a caliper distance matrix. So this matrix D has, has T rows where capital T is the number of treated subjects and capital C columns for the number of controls. And each element, the, the TC element, is going to be either the distance between the covariates between the Tth treated subject and the Cth control subject if their propensity scores are close enough. So if we look at this condition a little bit, you'll notice that this looks like the log odds that uh, person T was treated minus the log odds that person C was treated. And we're seeing that if it's less than some value epsilon. So we have control of this value epsilon. And what we're, what we're essentially saying is that we want to create this distance matrix so that people who had very similar propensity scores have an actual real distance between them. And if their propensity scores are quite far away, there's gonna be an infinite distance between them. And this is going to allow us to match people together who are similar in covariates, i.e. they have like very small road distances, but who are also similar in terms of their propensity score. And we'll see in a minute why that's important. But the idea is, you know, we, 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 we sort of formed this caliper distance matrix. And I should note that everything that we're doing here has been done without reference to the actual outcome. So we haven't touched our outcomes yet. So given this distance matrix, if we have a match, say any collection of pairs of treated and controlled subjects, let's say they're capital I pairs. So T1, C1 is the first pair all the way to TI, CI is the last pair. We can define the total distance where we just go to the corresponding T1, C1 element of that distance matrix T. We find that distance and we add them up. So we have this total distance for each match and we can solve an optimization problem where we find the optimal match, this M hat, which is kind of the match that minimizes this total distance. And I haven't written it down on the slide, but in the, the constraint in this minimization problem is, is a little bit tricky, but suffice it to say that we are finding a matching, like a bipartite matching between the treated subjects and the control subjects that minimizes a notion of distance between the two. So we're trying to find for every treated subject kind of the closest control subject where closest is measured in this, in this kind of slightly weird metric where the distance could be infinite if their propensity scores are far apart, or it could be equal to the, like the row distance between their covariates. And the reason that we would do that is because when we form this optimal match, it, we're, we're striking this balance between ensuring closeness in the covariates according to say the Mahalanobis distance, but we're also forcing closeness in, in, in propensity score, the probability of being treated. And the nice, the nice fact is that when you balance on a propensity score, you tend to balance observed covariates on average. So that means that when we look at the group of matched treated subjects and the matched control subjects, now the covariates are balanced. So for instance, when we, when we run this in, on our real data, we'll find, for instance, that you know, the, the, the treated subjects will start to look a lot like the matched controls according to the axis that we've measured. And that's really going to be the key. 
So here's what matching looks like. Oh, and, 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 I, and I will say that what's going to be critical moving on is an assumption of random treatment within match cells. Now we know, again, this is an observational study. We cannot assume that treatment was assigned randomly, but as you'll find, especially in causal inference, you can't really do anything unless you are willing to make some assumptions. And, and so this is the assumption that I'm going to ask you to make right now, and we will weaken this assumption in a little bit. But one reason that you can at least kind of hold your nose making this assumption is because of the balance on observed covariance. Because remember, randomization balances both measured and unmeasured confounders, or unmeasured and measured covariates. And when we did all of this fancy matching, what we end up with is a set of treated subjects and a set of control subjects who are balanced on the variables that we have. So we don't know if they're balanced on the variables we don't have, but this is one of those unknowable unknowables. So this, I think it's okay to make this assumption, but it is an assumption nonetheless, and we will get to that in a second. So here's what matching looks like. You know, Byron, Byron Brown said that, you know, matching is a convincing demonstration, but I think if I, if I took this like optimization problem to my clinical collaborators and say, see, this means that we're, we're, we're safe to make causal inference, they would laugh me out of the room. Instead, you know, what we, what we did was we can, we can form what are known as these balance tables. And it really presents kind of what did these groups look like before and after matching. So down the columns, uh, down the rows here are, are different variables that we thought might be important in, in determining whether somebody played football and what their cognition was later in life. So you can see things like the IQ, and this is IQ measured in adolescence. We could see whether their teachers thought they were an outstanding student. We could see you know, what the education level of the, their father and their mother was. We could see whether they lived with both parents and whether their teachers encouraged college. And I think this teachers encouraged college is actually a pretty important confounder, especially when we're, we're thinking about cognitive outcomes later in life. Uh, and the reason for that is there, there are many studies that show that people who went to college have sort of better cognitive outcomes later in life. But if you were to receive encouragement to go to college, that might encourage you to you know, play sports because maybe that's how some people think their, their, their path to college will go. And so it's an important to make sure that the two groups are balanced with respect to this. And if you look at this table a little bit closely, you'll see that before matching, 57.7% of football players were encouraged by their teachers to go to college. Whereas in contrast, only 45.4% of the controls were. So if I didn't do any matching, if I just looked at the average cognitive outcomes between the football players and all of the controls, and I found a big difference, and I, and I ran and said, this is, a, this is proof that there is like a big uh, effect of playing football on later life cognition, somebody might look at this table and say, well, you know, this, this teacher's encouraging college, that might actually confound this, and there's a pretty big difference along this dimension. So how do I know that what I've, what difference in outcomes I've observed is really due to playing football as opposed to differences in teachers encouraging college? So we did a map, we, we, we built a match, and in the process of building the match, you know, there, there is an aspect of it where you, you sometimes have to drop controls who are very different than everybody else, and, and you sort of focus on a group that's most similar to the pool of treated subjects. And so when we did this match, we found that amongst matched controls, 55% of them were encouraged by their teachers to go to college. So the distance between, between the football players and the treated subjects, or the, the, the matched controls, is much smaller now. And so this is really the logic of matching and why it can be a, a particularly compelling demonstration that, that, that two groups are similar. You know, we're, we're really kind of refocusing our analysis on a comparable subsets, and, and this is gonna allow us to make sort of safer inference. So are there any questions about that um, before we kind of switch gears to talking about inference? Cool. So this is, I think, where I want to spend most of my time. Um, and, and for people who are familiar with uh, causal inference, this is going to be maybe the shortest introduction to potential outcomes and uh, please save your pitchforks for me for the end, uh, if, if you have an objection. So, so each subject in our study um, has hypothetically two potential outcomes. They have YI1 and YI0, where YI1 is the outcome we would observe if I receives the treatment. And YI0 is the outcome we would observe if I receives the control. So these are also sometimes considered counterfactuals. 
Now, the fundamental challenge of causal inference is that we only ever get to observe one of the two potential outcomes. So amongst the people in our observational study who played football, we only ever observed YI1. We never observed their potential outcome under control because they never received control. Similarly, for the control subjects who don't play football, we only ever observe YI0 and we never observe YI1. So, so from this perspective, causal inference is really nothing more than like a fancy missing data problem. And, and I think when you view causal inference through this lens, you can start to do a lot. And certainly that, that's what's been done before. So what we're going to focus today on is, is, is estimating or testing sharp null hypotheses of the following form. So we're going to let delta naught be some fixed constant. Um, and, and in this case, you might think of our potential outcomes might be the potential scores on a cognitive test. Um, so you might have a battery of cognitive assessments. You might have a total score. So we're dealing with sort of continuous value data. And so you might ask, what is, you know, I want to test whether there is a constant additive treatment effect. So every subject, the difference in their potential outcomes is some fixed scalar delta zero. So if we look at this equation, we immediately note two things. The first is we only ever get to observe one of the two y terms, right? This is, this is the fundamental problem. However, if we're willing to assume that the null is true for some fixed delta naught, so maybe delta naught is equal to zero is the hypothesis that there is no treatment effect for anybody. Um, you know, if for a fixed delta naught, if we're willing to assume this null, the sharp null, then we can actually impute the missing potential outcomes for the treated subjects. That is for the treated subjects, we have what's on the left-hand side. We really would like to know what's on the right-hand side. As soon as we have a value of delta naught that we're willing to assume for now, we can just subtract it and compute for every treated subject their sort of imputed potential outcome under control. So in a like matched pairs setup, in each matched pair, we can now under this imputation framework have access to two potential outcomes under control. One is for the control subject, and that's actually the outcome we observe. And the other is for the treated subject, which is, which is formed by subtracting the actual outcome they observe minus the putative delta naught. So the, the importance is that when we can assume the null hypothesis, so if we assume the null hypothesis is true, we can impute the missing potential outcome. And now, if we further assume that treatment was randomly allocated within matched sets. And that's a semi-reasonable assumption because we've constructed our matched sets so that each subject, each person inside of our matched set has really, really similar covariates and a really, really similar probability of receiving treatment. So under the null and under this assumption of randomization within matched sets, we would not expect a systematic difference in the distribution of the potential outcomes under control between the treated and the control subject. So this is going to allow us to form a two sample test statistic in order to test the sharp null. And so what I'm describing is really nothing, nothing sort of uh, in principle that's, that's too different from like a standard two sample test. We're going to assume a null hypothesis. Under that null, we're going to compute a test statistic and then we'll see how extreme that test statistic is. So what's important here is that, you know, this, this assumption of randomization within, within match sets, because under this null hypothesis, we don't expect systematic differences between the imputed potential outcomes for the treated subjects and the observed potential outcomes for the control subjects. And so one test statistic that we might form might be the number of matched sets in which the treated subjects potential outcome under control is greater than the control subjects. So that is we, we count the matched sets in which the imputed YI zero for the treated subject is greater than the YI zero for the control subject. And under the null and under a sort of assumption that treatment was randomly allocated within match sets, we would expect this number to be about a half. That, that's sort of the expectation of the test statistic under the null. And so if we observe something, if we observe that, you know, in 90% of our match sets, this imputed potential outcome for treated was bigger than the potential outcome for control, then we would reject the null. And this is really the standard logic of null hypothesis statistic, uh, significance testing. But What's important here is that we're not making any distributional assumption about the potential outcomes. We're not assuming that the potential outcomes are, are so normally distributed or come from a mixture of normals or anything. What's, what's grounding our inference is this assumed randomization of treatment. 
And, and the idea is that you know, within a match set, we have one treated subject and one control subject. We can imagine a different treatment assignment which flips the labels. And if we flip the labels within some match sets, we can compute a different test statistic. And if we do this for all of the different possible treatment assignments, we can build up a null distribution. So if you're familiar with sort of permutational tests or, or randomization inference, this is really all we're doing. And the idea is that different treatment assignments generate a distribution of, of the test statistic under the null. And so if we see our observed test statistic as extreme, we can reject this delta zero. So that's nice. This is, this is kind of how you would test a single sharp null hypothesis. But you might say, okay, well, I've, I've tested you know, a null hypothesis that delta zero, the treatment effect was zero. What if I want to test that the, the treatment effect was five? Well, you're, you're totally permitted to do that. You can still test that at you know, the same level alpha, say the 5% significance level. And the reason you don't have to, to do that, and you can actually, you don't, you don't have to adjust your alpha for multiple comparisons, is really the logic of confidence intervals. So we can take this sort of testing procedure and we can do it for a whole bunch of different delta nuts. For each delta nut, again, we're going to re-impute the missing potential outcome, recompute sort of a permutational test statistic and, and make a decision whether to reject or not. And, and if we do this, we can then form like a hodges lehman point estimate. We can form a confidence interval by inverting the test statistic. And, and so things look pretty rosy. But again, all of this inference is predicated on the assumption that treatment was randomly allocated within match sets. And there is an additional step now to, to weaken this assumption. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through all of the details but suffice it to say that there is a machinery to, to weaken the assumption of random and equal probability of treatment within map sets. And you compute sort of worst case uh, null distributions. And the basic idea is you, you try to weaken this assumption systematically until you start to make substantively different conclusions. So if you were able to reject the null hypothesis uh, that uh, of no treatment, and as you, under this assumption, and if you start weakening it and weakening it and weakening it, eventually you're going to fail to reject. And you can start to measure the sensitivity of your study um, to say hidden biases. So it's a really powerful tool, um, sensitivity analyses. And, and if you're interested in this sort of stuff, um, I'll note that a sensitivity analysis is really what convinced a lot of people that smoking is what causes lung cancer. I mean, there's a whole history of this in, in statistics and it's really fascinating. So if you're interested in this stuff, do, do ask at the end. So to, to, to move on a little bit, this seems like pretty standard stuff. Like it, you, we've got this binary treatment, we did some matching. Once we built a match, we did randomization inference, we can do a sensitivity analysis, everything seems great. And, and that's what we thought when we, when we started all of this work. Until we like had a, a meeting with our collaborators and one of them pointed out you know, your treatment condition is playing football and your control condition is not playing football. And, and, and our, our collaborator looked around the room and said, well, I didn't play football in, in high school, but I swam. And so that meets the control condition. And somebody else said, well, I didn't play any sports at all. I, I was a theater kid. This is not to overly generalize. Um, and, and they said, we both satisfy the control condition. And then we started thinking, you know, did we somehow oversimplify this analysis entirely? You know, we, we started with this analysis of playing football and not playing football, but maybe there are versions of the treatment, or at least in this case, versions of the control. And so how, how worried about this should we be? And the reason we might have to be worried is that athletes and non-athletes can differ in both measured and unmeasured ways. And so the, the question we were really asking is, you know, when we, when we did our analysis and we observed some differences and we made some inferential conclusions, we asked, is this an oversimplified analysis? And so we thought about it a little bit. And then we realized that in our data, we actually had information about whether our subjects played other sports besides football or whether they played a sport or not. And so you might say that the best way to alleviate this concern about versions of treatment is to do four comparisons. You compare the football players to all of your controls. Then you compare the football players to just those people who played another sport like basketball or baseball or tennis. Then you compare the football players to the people who didn't play any sports in high school at all. 
And finally, you compare the sport controls and the non-sport controls. And you can make the argument that if we could demonstrate a consistent, a, like a logically consistent effect in all four of these comparisons, then we really have isolated what you can say is specifically an effect of playing football. And so this seems reasonable. But if you, if you think about it a little bit, what I've suggested is, you know, you start with this, this big comparison and maybe you have thousands of subjects and you have a really well-powered study. And I'm telling you, you've got to do that comparison that's well-powered. And then you've got to break it up into four more comparisons, which are all using less subjects and are all less power. And you've now have to test four hypotheses. So you've got to adjust the level at which you test them to control for multiple testing problems. And so you might say that to alleviate this concern, we have to throw away all power to detect even large effects. And that would be pretty frustrating if, if because of this concern, we had to sort of weaken our study's ability to find you know, big effects of playing football. And so we, we went back to the drawing board and, and you know, Ryden, one of, my, one of my collaborators, came up with this really nice, uh, yeah, so really nice way to, to avoid a naive correction for multiplicity diminishing our power. And it involved exploiting a logical order in between hypotheses. And there was kind of an order of testing, or if you're familiar with this literature, it's really a close testing procedure. Um, and you can kind of structure the comparisons in such a way that you never have to reduce the alpha in which you're testing these hypotheses. So you can always test at the 5% level. And, and there's this sort of like ordered stopping procedure that allows you to perform these types of comparisons and alleviate concern about multiple versions of treatment. And if you're interested, uh, I can send you the paper at another time. So this was sort of one of the kind of curious artifacts and sort of one of the curious challenges we ran into in the, in the course of doing all of this work. So this concludes sort of all of the, the methods and um, I want to talk a little bit about the main results. So before that, I want to mention a couple of the data sets. So we, we use data from two really big longitudinal studies. So the first one is this Wisconsin longitudinal study that's followed about 10,000 people since they graduated from high school in 1957. So when the WLS was started, it was actually started as a, as a random sample from the entire population of high school seniors in the year 1957. And the 10,000 subjects that they recruited represent about a third of that population. So this was a really representative sample of, of everybody in a particular area at a particular point in time. And the WLS has been used to really study, you know, how people's educational and economic uh, outcomes evolve over time. But luckily, they included a measure of whether people play football, and they included health outcomes later in life, so it was really amenable for our study. And what we found was that by the time people got to age 65, the football players didn't perform substantially worse on cognitive assessments or mental health assessments than matched controls. So we really didn't find ev evidence of harmful effects of playing football on cognition and mental health within this population. We then, in a follow-up paper um, that came out earlier this year, looked at a couple of different outcomes, like whether football players experienced more pain at age 65, or whether they had sort of higher body mass indices during, during adulthood. And what we find was that you know, there was no evidence of harmful effects on pain outcomes but there was a small effect on the likelihood of being obese uh, in adulthood for football players. So when we found these, we were like pretty shocked. You know, we, we thought we were gonna find some really, really huge effect. And, and, and so we were, we were pretty stumped about how, how, how we could reconcile this with sort of public understanding. And once, once our first paper came out, there were, there were people who said, well, you know, you studied people who played football in the 50s and Wisconsin in the 1950s was a pretty geographically and ethnically homogenous uh, group of people. So we don't know if the study results generalize. And, and indeed, that's a really important point. So a big limitation of some of the work that we did in this, in this study is that football's changed fundamentally. And, and you know, in the 50s, when these kids were playing, uh, plastic shell helmets hadn't been widely adopted. And the adoption of plastic shell helmets is really what gives rise to the types of head trauma that we see now. Um, you know, when people were wearing the leather helmets, concern was about them like cracking open their skulls and, and bleeding out. And so they put on plastic helmets and then they said, it's now totally safe to like bang heads together, um, which we're now finding may not be the case. 
So, so some people said, like uh, a study of people from Wisconsin in the 50s, who knows what we can say about that? How can we generalize? And so we found another adolescent, we've, we found another longitudinal study, the National Longitudinal Study of Adolescent to Adult Health. This is Ad Health, which is run out of UNC, and it's followed about 10,000 subjects since 1994. And so it recruited these 10,000 people when they were in grades 7 through 12 in 1994. So they were a substantially younger cohort um, than the people in the WLS. And so we kind of re-replicated our study design uh, using data from the Ad Health study. And what we found was that by the time our, our study subjects reached early adulthood, around age 30 or so, the football players didn't have noticeably worse mental health than, than the match controls. They weren't more likely to abuse alcohol or tobacco or, or prescription drugs in early adulthood. And, and we were sort of a little bit surprised by this as well. And at, at this point, I'm gonna issue sort of two huge caveats that if you, if you leave this talk with nothing else, please leave with, with these two caveats. The results on, on these two, on, on this slide, in no way prove that football is totally safe. We're, we're not holding these papers up as proof that, you know, you have nothing to worry about when, when kids play football. We're not saying that our results should, should discount any efforts to, to uh, you know, improve the safety of the game. And the second big caveat is that, you know, we were focused on estimating an effect of, of just playing football, not on head trauma specifically or the number of concussions specifically. So it's totally plausible, and, and my sort of personal belief is that it's quite likely that people who have uh, like a big history of concussions or a history of a lot of concussions will suffer from sort of more adverse health effects later in life. But you know, our, our studies were just not set up to to establish that. And 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 sort of as with most observational studies, there there are some important limitations, and and, and one of the big ones in ours is that we were using a binary indicator of football participation. And our indicator was actually noisy and in some cases incomplete. And to give you a sense of why, the, the WLS, when they, when they recruited people in the 50s, they, were not, they did not anticipate that people would use the data that they collected to estimate the effects of playing football. They were interested in whether kids were going to college and what jobs they wanted to do. So it was only later that people in Wisconsin uh, at the, the university there went back to these, to these subjects, they got their high school yearbooks, and they went through each yearbook and pulled out everybody who they could reasonably say played football. So that was actually our indicator of football participation. And so you might worry that this type of imperfect retrospective measure might accidentally uh, leave out some of the treated subjects and misclassify them as controls, or maybe vice versa, it might misclassify controls as, as treatment. And so we went to the people at the WLS and. Uh, we really worked with them to, to make sure that this was like pretty, they, th to find out that actually their pers activities participation was pretty high fidelity, but there still might be some, some mistakes. I think a slightly more important thing is that you might have caught that all of our, all of our, um, all of our hypotheses were about constant additive treatment effects. And in reality, I think it's pretty safe to say that the, the effect of playing football is heterogeneous. The problem for us is a lot of what we might ex expect to drive effect heterogeneity, a lot of effect modifiers, for instance, were just not available. So we didn't have access to say what position people played when they played football. And we, we know that different positions experience different, different levels of head trauma. We, we don't have measures of you know, age of first exposure or, or injury history. So I, I would say that you know, if we had it, we definitely could try to account for it. The problem is that we, we just didn't have access. It was kind of the best one to do. And I'm running out of time, and that was like such a dismal note to end on. So I want to give a plug about why I think this is still like an exciting area to work in. And, and so to do that, I'll start by saying all of what I've presented here is really just the first crack at, at estimating the causal effect of playing football. And I think there's a lot of work that's left to be done. And in particular, what's most exciting to me are some of the methodological opportunities. So all of our work so far has been about estimating the effect at a particular point in time, you know, at age 30, at age 65, at age 75. What we weren't really able to do at the time because we lacked the data and sort of we lacked the methods was to estimate how effects of playing football might change over time and how they might simultaneously vary across the population. 
So it could be the case that there is a subgroup in the population for whom the effect of playing football on cognition sort of worsens over time. And in another group, it might start off with a really big effect that, that sort of attenuates over time. So figuring out how effects change and how, how these changes vary across the population is, is, is a really important problem. And, and that's sort of driven some of my more recent methodological interests and with some colleagues, we have a new paper out on some Bayesian ways of, of estimating these sort of varying effects, um, which, which seem to work really well. So I'm kind of excited about bringing those methods to bear on this problem. And I think the, the ultimate sort of holy grail here is to one day be able to identify subgroups of children who are sort of most at risk of adverse health outcomes before they start to play football and, and really try to intervene there. And, and so I think in order to do that, there's some really exciting data analysis opportunities. And I think there's some opportunities to do some pretty cool statistics. And so with that, I'm gonna conclude. Y'all have been great. Thank you again to Christina and Arcady for the, for the invitation. Don't hesitate to, to email me and if you want any of the papers or to find out more, you can visit the website. So thank you. Let us thank the speaker now, and uh, we have some time for questions. And uh, definitely, well, let me start using my privilege of one of the seminar organizers. I have a couple of general questions. Uh, I really like this, uh, uh, well, this approach to study, so it sounds good. I have a couple of concerns which are more general, and the first one is, there could be some lurking variables responsible for differences which are not in the list of your studied variables. So it could be that there are some subtle differences between population playing football and not playing football, and we cannot catch it. And I wonder what can be done to address that. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And that's the, sort of, that's the sort of major problem with any observational study. There could be some unmeasured confounder that's, that's really driving mm -hmm. the differences. Mm -hmm. And, and so the, within the sort of matching and randomization approach, the, the, real, the real trick is, is to do a sensitivity analysis. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the best way to describe one is to describe the first sensitivity analysis, which was about smoking and lung cancer. Mm -hmm. And so there were some observational studies that, that suggested that smoking caused lung cancer. And, and Ron Fisher came out and said, no, no, it must be some genetic factor or, or some hormone. Mm -hmm. And the sensitivity analysis came back and said that, you know, if there really was this sort of speculative hidden genetic factor or hidden hormone, then it would have had to be nine times more prevalent amongst smokers than non-smokers. And it would have had to make you sort of nine times more likely to develop cancer than not. And so what it does is it takes this sort of speculative criticism of an observational study, and it gives it some sort of quantitative barrier that that speculative concern needs to cross. So people at the time said these genetic factors just don't have this big of effect sizes. They're, they're not nine times more likely to cause cancer than not. And so this kind of strengthened the evidence that what they found was actually causal. So that, that's kind of the logic of a sensitivity analysis. You mm -hmm. can say that, you know, maybe there's something that's unmeasured. How sensitive am I, are my conclusions to, to the presence of unmeasured confounders or how big an effect would an unmeasured confounder have to have on the probability of treatment and on the sort of probability of a worse outcome in order for me to change my conclusion, you know, to not reject a hypothesis mm -hmm. that I've already rejected. So that's the sort of standard answer. Um, in this particular case, you know, the general flavor of, of this type of sensitivity analysis is that your p-values increase as you, as you sort of weaken the assumptions and, and we sort of had non we had sort of null or non significant results to start with. And, and so there was a decision that the sensitivity analysis doesn't really tell us anything more or anything new, but it's definitely sort of the next step in the pipeline. If, if we did detect an effect, the next step would have been to do a sensitivity analysis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is a question from Christina in chat, uh, which, so, do you yeah. think the position is watering down the effect and making the effect harder to detect? Yeah, so um, I think there's a couple of ways to, to answer this. Um, this gets at, I think, heterogeneous effects. And, you know, we were testing sort of Fisher sharp nulls. There's the whole Fisher naming controversy of whether you should test 
whether the actual of a constant treatment effect or if you should test an average treatment effect and, and there's sort of different modes of inference. I mean, probably is the, is the real answer that, you know, we might not have detected an effect because we didn't have access to position. Mm -hmm. um, I think another, another thing that I didn't mention was the, the instruments we were using, our actual outcomes were these sort of psychometric instruments. And it's entirely possible that football playing does affect cognition, but existing psychometric instruments are just not capable of picking up on those differences. They, 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 they lack power or specificity. Mm -hmm. So that could be another reason for the null effect. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to say too much more because it, it, this starts to get onto the sort of like, we can speculate all day about, you know, why we didn't find an effect, but there's nothing quantitative that I could point to you. Yeah, sure. Um, I will say that we did try some of the new kind of machine learning kind of ways of estimating heterogeneous treatment effects. And we tried like honest trees and Bayesian causal forests and, and all sorts of stuff. And we got like substantively similar conclusions. But I think a large part of that is because we didn't have the effect modifiers. So if we don't have access to the variables that drive heterogeneity, it might be difficult to estimate it. But that, that's definitely next on our to do. Yep, thank you. And um, I will allow myself one more question before letting others speak. And uh, this question is, my general concern with uh, this matching methodology would be uh, we are definitely losing a lot of data. So we are uh, losing the sample size of the control group, though uh, we might not have perfect individual matches, but we might have valuable information which we uh, are losing this way. What do you think about that? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there's people were excluded. So there's, there's sort of two ways of excluding controls. Mm -hmm. um, one is if they lacked common support or sort of violated positivity assumptions. Mm -hmm. So one of the assumptions that's under the hood here is that every base, for every set of possible covariates, the probability of treatment is bounded strictly between zero and one. So we don't have people who like the probability of treatment was always one or always zero. Because for those people, you know, you can't form a meaningful contrast. It's, it's kind of, you can't extrapolate when there's no data there. Um, so there were people who were excluded for this sort of positivity violations and sort of lack of common support. And for that, I'm not as worried about throwing away people because those are the ones who we can't actually define a meaningful counterfactual. If there are more people who are just unmatched that you drop, there are actually some methods. I think Ben Hansen has some methods um, mm -hmm. for, for using information from the pool of unmatched controls mm -hmm. to, to, to kind of adjust. So you can kind of think about that potential outcome as a, as a function and learn the potential outcome function of, as a function of covariates amongst the controls that weren't matched. Um, so there are a lot of sort of adjustments you can do. So there are ways to incorporate them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, sometimes you have to exclude people because you can't, you, you shouldn't extrapolate for that. Yep. And, and other times you, you lose them, you do lose some power. And, and it's, a, it's a great point. Thank you. Well, we have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, anybody else, please. I see that some people... Uh, play their videos, which means that they probably can ask questions, unmute yourself and ask, or as Christina mentions, well, you could use chat and just type things in. So, Oh, so there's a question in the chat. Um, uh -huh. So position matters when separating players between those on the line and those who do not. Offensive, so these are the people who butt heads against each other. Repeated headbutting also has a causal effect. Um, in addition to the hard head hits that cause concussions. So yeah, that's, so that's really getting at, you know, what is the treatment that we're really after here? Um, I think once you start to go into head trauma, it becomes a little bit dicey because that's hard to measure. So there are some measures of like retrospective measures of head trauma, many of which are position based. So I know at BU, they've really pioneered this 
this retrospective head trauma index where they ask football players, you know, what positions did you play? Approximately what position of the time, like what percentage of the time did you play in these positions? And they come up with some index of, of about how much head trauma they experienced, but that's like necessarily imperfect. And especially when we're talking about sort of cognitive outcomes, like retrospective measures, you know, there's a lot of recall bias that you might subject yourself to. Um, there is some potential of, you know, people putting devices inside of helmets to measure, like to measure acceleration and deceleration, but like we're, we're just nowhere close to getting the scale of data that we need for that. But, but I think this is all an excellent question that, you know, estimating the effect of hard head hits on, on later life health or estimating the effect of the number of concussions. Um, I think these are all exciting directions. But, but I think we might not be at a point where we have the data that's high fidelity enough to do that. Thank you. Okay, that was a great question regarding positions. Anything else? Uh, did I play football? Uh, no, <laughs> I did not. Um, I, I, I most certainly did not. But I guess here in Texas, it's a religion at least. Probably Tuesday through no, no, it's seven <laughs> days a week now. College, professional, high school, middle school, Pee Wee. Monday, yeah, seven days a week. Oh, that's, that's good. I, I should say that I'm getting to the age where according to your study, it's really important to watch out for negative consequences of playing sports early. Well, I played chess mostly, so that was <laughs> pretty safe, I believe. Uh, I don't know, maybe somebody, maybe you cracked somebody over the head with, with the board in frustration. That, that could be, that could yeah. be dangerous. Yeah, um, that's hard to quantify these dangers. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think what, I, I, I don't want to, maybe I'll, I'll leave this. People sometimes ask me what my like, personal belief about, about these dangers are. And, you know, at, at some level, I'm an, I'm an empiricist. And... We can speculate all we want about large effects mm -hmm. and harmful effects, but if we don't see it in data, then mm -hmm. like, we might have to adjust our like our we might have to adjust our beliefs. Um, that being said, I don't think we have perfect data and perfect methods yet. So, like, I think we have to keep trying to, in some sense, keep trying to find these large effects that everybody's are concerned about. Um, and. And yeah, like, unfortunately, like this is the nature of science. Like, unfortunately, we don't have the answer that everybody wants, um, but we should still keep doing science. Well, thank you for this answer. I think that that's a great way to complete the talk. So you found really nice words to answer this question. And uh, I think that uh, if there are no questions coming anymore, at this point, we will have to let the speaker go. And I really think it was a fantastic way to start our semester with uh, this uh, really interesting talk on a very interesting topic. And uh, thank you, Samir, for being with us. And uh, I believe that our next talk will be in two weeks. So, uh, Samir, if you are interested to visit us as a guest, uh, oh, you are always welcome to be in our group. You see, the group is pretty... Yeah. Well, pretty quiet, but nice. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. It was a real pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Christina, for organizing that. I see you're on the way, so safe travel. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yep.